Section number 14 of The Mystery of the Ocean Star. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Clip. The Mystery of the Ocean Star by W. Clark Russell. Section 14. Weevil's Lecture. Weevil's Lecture. A few days ago I received the following letter from my old friend Captain Weevil. I have been asked by Captain Martin Gale, who keeps a nautical academy for young gents, to give them a lecture on practical seamanship. Perhaps you would like to hear me. If so be you should come, please to recollect that a ship's forecastle isn't a Oxford University. He gave me the address, and signed his letter, Yours Without Language. I had met Captain Gale, but did not know that he taught navigation to youths. There might be something to amuse and to interest me in old Weevil's lecture, I thought, so I made up my mind to attend it. Gale's house was not a very spacious one. He had located himself in Bayswater, where perhaps he stood a better chance of finding pupils and young gentlemen intended for the merchant service than had he lived in the East End. On the other hand, Weevil lives at Poplar, so as will be seen, he had a long distance to travel to oblige his friend. He arrived in a suit of shiny black cloth and stiff high shirt collar, in which his jolly round face and bald head rested like an egg in a cup. There were eleven pupils present, averaging in years from thirteen to eighteen. Old Martin Gale, a small, spare man, with a head lightly covered with straw-colored hair which time had left unchanged, and a mouth with a singular twist in it that brought it, as he used to say, well up into his port cheek, had arranged for the lecture by rigging up a desk with a small union jack over it. Weevil stood at this desk, Gale sat alongside of him, and the audience, that numbered three or four others besides the pupils and myself, sat in chairs facing the two skippers. When all was ready, old Gale got up and made out a sort of preface full of coughs and awkward flourishings of the hand. It was difficult to gather what he wanted to say, but happily his introductory observations were of no consequence. He sat down, and Captain Weevil stood up. The old fellow, with a smiling face, took stock of us with a long, overhauling look. He did not exhibit that nervousness which I might have expected to find in a man so sensible as he was of his deficiency in language. Drawing out an immense red pocket handkerchief with white spots, he polished his head, wiped his mouth, and began as follows. My lads, you're all a-going to sea, I hear, and very glad I am to know it, for you look a tidy lot of youths, and never was there such a time as now when the merchant service wanted good men. I suppose none of you exactly know what you're going to, and it's best you shouldn't. The sea's a manly life, and several joys attend it, such as the pleasure of getting home, the runs ashore, and the sights seen in foreign ports, and the likes of such things as that. But it's a rough life, too. There's a deal of wet and sleeplessness in it. There's money to be earned, but little to be saved. And when at sea there is such a call upon the attention of a right-minded man as no other profession can equal in severity. Hear, hear, said old Gale. Only consider, young gents, what the feelings of a captain who's got principles and a correct understanding, what the feelings of such a man must be when he walks the quarter-deck of his ship and reflects upon his power, and how the lives of all the people in the vessel, together with the vessel herself and all she may contain, a hundred thousand pounds worth of goods, perhaps, are dependent upon him. My precious eyes, there's responsibility for you. I was once master of a small ship, in which I took out two hundred convicts and a number of soldiers, and I very well remember one night there being a calm on, and the vessel lying as still as a sleeping baby in the arms of its mother, stopping dead in my pacing the short poop, and thinking of the crowds of people that lay asleep under my feet. And my lads, I was so much agitated by the reflection, so much bewildered, all on a sudden as it might be by this thought of what was on my shoulders, and what was expected of me, that I tell you as a man who has seen some tough weather and is not easily moved, it would have done me good if I could have cried. Here a boy laughed. 
Old Gale fixed a steady gaze upon him under knitted brows. Weevil, giving his head another polish with the handkerchief that was nearly as big as a small ensign, proceeded. Yes, young gents, I could have cried. And if I had, I shouldn't have been ashamed of owning to it, for you may depend upon it that there's nary man as can suffer in his manhood by the feelings of his heart making themselves when very strong expressed in his eyes. He blew his nose with a report as of a main topsail bursting in a gale of wind, buried his handkerchief vehemently in his pocket, and continued, You'll understand, young gentlemen, that this here lecture of mine concerns sailing ships only, for you all of ye will have come to starve in some square riggers before you come to steam, and there's nothing aboard a steamer outside the engine room you can learn that you oughtn't to have brought aboard with you as a piece of knowledge from the sailing ship. I reckon it's the intention of every young gent, as is looking at me, to become in due course a mate and then a master. Your respected parents will no doubt apprentice you first. What benefits you're going to get for the money it'll cost your pa's to send you to sea, I sure I don't know. For my part, I'd rather give you a hand through the hosepipe. Better, I say, to begin in the forecastle outright than in a deck house amidships. It must come to your knowing all about a ship from the flying jib boom end to the taffrail. And why not begin in the place where you get the soundest marine education? However, this is no business of mine, and I didn't mean that this lecture should intervolve it. Involve it, said Gale, mildly. Well, what did I say? said Weevil, turning to him. You said intervolve it, exclaimed one of the boys. Oh, well, then, involve it said old Weevil blandly. But intervolve it sounds to me the correctest. Your captain here, my old friend Gale, is a man whose abilities as a sailor I know well and thoroughly respect, and I don't think, therefore, he'll quarrel with me for saying that, in my opinion, there's too much fuss made about navigation in these times. Now, I'm not going to stand here and say that a man oughtn't to be able to find his way about with a sexton, Though the best sailors the world has ever seen carried their ships safely all over the globe without caring whether the sun shone or not, and in perfect ignorance of crinometers. But what I will stand here and say is that the sort of knowledge that is nowadays expected in mates and masters don't touch the reasons why ninety out of every hundred ships are lost or damaged. Don't go and pretend that Weevil stood up here and told ye that navigation's of no use. That wouldn't be true. But what you may say is the responsibilities of mates and masters are so great, he considers there's a deal too much weight laid upon the scientific part of seamanship, and much too little laid upon practical knowledge. Don't you go and suppose that because you're smart hands at working out sights, you're fit for having any kind of charge in a ship? No, young gents. You may have Nori's epitome and the nautical almanac at your fingers' ends, you may know all about the sun, moon, and stars, and what to do with them, but without the practical knowledge you can only get by going to sea, by watching, by thinking, by arguing, by suffering, you'll no more be fit to take command of a vessel than the greenest hand that ever signed articles for a shilling a month. He paused, with a sidelong glance at old Gale, who sat with a wooden face, waiting, perhaps, for further opinions before he ventured to comment. "'It's the rarest thing in the world,' continued Weevil, "'to hear of a loss through want of a knowledge of navigation, which shows that there can be no lack of that sort of learning knocking about at sea. Disasters happen from the want of simple precautions. The lead isn't used. There's too much hurry in thick weather, Currents haven't been allowed for. A bad lookout has been kept. Pay close attention, young gents, to all that Captain Martin Gale tells ye, and master the navigation he's teaching you as fully as you can. But bear in mind also what old Weevil tells you. The safety of ships depends upon so many points, which can only be understood by carefully doing your duty as sailors, and by getting all the ideas you can, by watching and studying, that it's nothing short of a crime and a deceit to young men to put navigation at the top of the list of a man's requirements to act as mate or master. Gale slightly shook his head, a gesture old Weevil did not seem to observe. 
Science, young gents, on a fine day or a clear night, will tell you where you are. And that's always worth knowing. But where does practice come in? It comes in in collision, or, I should say, in the avoidance of it, in stranding, in anchoring, in the shifting of cargoes, in the choking of pumps, in leakage. It comes in on lee shores. You can't do without it in foggy weather. You must be burnt if it ain't there in case of fire. It's wanted when there's ice, when the ship's dismasted, when sails are lost by splitting or being blown away, in capsizing and squalls, when you lose your rudder in lowering boats, when you're deeply laden, and when you are lying to, when, if you are light, your ballast shifts, and when you're in soundings. There, my lads, exclaimed the old fellow, who had been gradually raising his voice till it grew penetrating with its triumphant treble. That's where practice steps in, and in every case I've mentioned navigation wouldn't be of more service to you than the tail of an eel to a drowning man. Do you allow that, Gale? Yes, yes, answered Gale, that's right enough, Weevil. Only you see, as mate or master, a man must know navigation. Why, yes, of course, cried Weevil, and so he ought. But what I say is don't let it boss all marine knowledge. Don't let it stand at top of the catalogue as if it was first and essential, and all what comes under it useful only, and to be picked up as you like and as you go. An old North Shields captain, who has been to sea as master and man for fifty years, and upon whose nautical opinion I pin my faith if I should be drowned for it if he proved wrong, this man said to me, any seaman of practical experience, having sufficient skill and good judgment in calculating the position of a ship by the use of a chart and a latitude, could navigate a vessel with almost as much safety on a voyage around the world as those who have a thorough knowledge of navigation in all its branches, provided he used proper care when in the latitude of danger. I do not mean to say, said he, that a sufficient knowledge of navigation is not necessary for those in charge of vessels. I only intend to show that the safety of ships does not depend upon that point so much as it is generally believed. And those are exactly my sentiments, said old Weevil. Here the old gentleman broke off by saying something in a whisper to Captain Gale, the meaning of which was presently interpreted by the arrival of a glass of brandy and water, at which the old fellow took a pull with a thoughtful countenance, though his preoccupation could not veil the expression of relish that entered his features with the first drink. "'And now, my hearties,' said he presently, "'for a few further observations touching the manly calling it's my pleasure to lecture you about.' First of all, my advice to you is when you go to sea, don't be too much of a sailor. Don't think it's nautical to use bad language. Learn to keep your temper. Bear a hand when you're called upon to do a job, and being gentlemen and the sons of gentlemen and ladies, strive never to lose the privilege of being what you are by acting as if you were something else. Make no mistakes. Sailors like to have gentlemen over them. There is something about refinement and good breeding that makes those who serve under such qualities and a man proud of him, if he'll only allow them to be so. As for me, I'm no example to talk to ye in this manner, I dare say you'll think. My father was a ship's carpenter, and I begun life afore the mast, and I was seventeen years old afore I could read, and I upon nineteen afore I could write my own name." Here one of the boys laughed, but his merriment was promptly extinguished by a blow in the ribs from the elbow of the lad who sat next to him. "'But such as my beginning was,' said the old man, looking gently at the youth whose guffaw had made him falter for a moment, "'yet when I found myself in a position that gave me power over others, it was always my struggle to behave towards them as if I was in their place and they over me. The gentleman in the meaning of that word, so far as education goes and polished manners, I wasn't. But that didn't prevent me from trying to act as if I had the self-respect of the first nobleman in the land. And one consequence of my, of my resolution to deal with sailors as though they were my messmates more than my shipmates, 
and as though they had the feelings in them of men capable of being maddened by insult and injury and of being softened and rendered good and true men by kindness and consideration was that when i was mate my watch was always the smartest of the two and when i was captain my crew kept to me as if the ship had been their home ashore therefore young gents my advice to you is never be too nautical let the spirit of the old ocean be in your hearts to the full but be careful to carry the proprieties of the land with you and never forget whatever be your usage and whatever lot may befall you that you are gentlemen whom the people under you will respect admire and be loyal to as such so long as you make them understand that you are true to the best feelings of your nature I was so pleased with these remarks that I uttered a loud cheer that was immediately taken up by all the others, and the room rang again to some very hearty lively notes. Weevil looked extremely pleased, and gazed at the lads from one to another with a most benevolent and affectionate expression in his eyes. And now, said he, young gents, for a few plain observations of a practical nature, things I should be glad if you'd keep fast in your memory though of course it isn't to be expected you could grasp my meaning till you've been at sea for some time first as to collision that is the greatest danger of these days and i reckon that the shipmaster who's seen much service and has never been in a mess of this kind is a man that truly deserves decorating now here's a rule or two that you'd be doing yourselves good by stowing away in your heads for future use first of all the officer of the watch should keep a bright and proper lookout at all times and he should also see that the hands stationed for this duty are vigilant and wide awake to their responsibilities and next as i'm talking of sailing ships always have your vessel under such sail as gives you command of her because at any moment you may want her to answer the helm quickly make up your mind to act at once and never shift your helm a second time for the most drowning quality in a man that I'm aware of is indecision. Old Gale coughed, and Weevil looked at him, but nothing being said, the skipper proceeded. Never cross a ship's hoss when you can pass under her stern. When navigation is difficult by reason of crowded waters, keep the best men in the ship at the helm. And now for some advice touching anchoring. Take care never to ride with a short scope of cable if the sea is heavy. Always have your second anchor ready in case of the other getting foul. See your stay sails and other canvas that may be needed, all ready to help in keeping the anchor to clear. Sight your anchor if you think it's foul, and never bring up in a ship's hoss if the wind's strong and there's a lee tide. Leakage in these days is different from what it used to be. I mean that when an iron plate gets a hole knocked in it or rivet r drops out or landings open it's more serious than the started butt or open seam of a timber-built ship still i would say disheartening as leaky ships are to seamen never be afraid of a leak scores of seamen will tell you that for years and years and voyages they have made it was either pump or sink with them a friend of mine told me he was twelve years at sea before he knew what a tight ship was it was the first duty of a man to bring his ship home, whether he belongs forward or aft, and short of the breakdown or choking of the pumps, or the absolute exhaustion of the crew, there is no excuse for abandonment on the grounds of leakage only. As to ice, there is not much to fear from that, if you'll only make up your mind, owner or no owner, never to be in a hurry, when hurry may be dangerous. Ice is a thing a man ought to be able to smell. I always could, interrupted old Gale. Aye, and so could I, exclaimed Weevil, even in the midst of a snowstorm, and when the berg was to leeward and three miles off. Anyhow, if you can't smell it, there's a thermometer to look at. There's nothing that ought to keep master's and mate's eyes so skinned as ice. You want optics astern of ye, as well as on either side of your nose. I've been at night sailing amongst quantities of loose ice, and found the only safe thing to do was to keep the main yard back and the vessel under such sail as to give me ready command over her for wearing or backing astern quickly. Then, young gents, there's the question of dismasting. There's less chance of this disaster happening now in these days of wire rigging than formerly when hemp rigging was used, which when new was slackened and was of no use as supports unless set up taut afresh, 
which might be required when no safe opportunity offered to do it. Yet I've known ships to be dismasted by masts having been sprung unknown to the captain, perhaps through moving ships in a harbor and getting foul of other vessels, and my advice to you is to remember, when you come to taking charge, always to carefully examine your spars before starting on long voyages, especially in the way of the cap and cross trees. So with sails. Canvas, like crews, wants kindly usage, or it'll betray you. To get canvas furled or reefed with as little shaking as possible is a test of good seamanship, in my opinion, and I should judge a good deal of a man's sailorly qualities by his method of going to work in that direction. See to your clue lines particularly, that they be of sound ropes, and contrive that your bunt lines, brails, reef points, all the ropes that are in constant friction with the sails, be of the softest material, for I've known many a sail to be split through friction of ropes, when other parts of it were strong enough to have held out in a hurricane. I should like to say something to you about squalls, how best to behave in them, about the loss of rudders, the stowage of cargoes, and many other matters which belong to practical seamanship, and which you'd have thoroughly to master if ever you are to be held qualified to take charge. But until you go to sea and get to know the names of things, and find out what the ocean is like, and what a tumultuous playground it is, and how it requires as close watching as if every cloud overhead and every billow underneath was a wild beast to be kept at bay only by keeping your eye fixed upon it, much of what I should have to say would be unintelligible to you. Therefore, young gentlemen, I'll wind up by exhorting ye to understand that the knowledge of navigation alone ain't going to make sailor men of you. Learn it, certainly, and get to know as much of it as you can, but don't let it boss the other requirements. The best sailors the world ever saw, the safest masters to sail under, the bravest and most skillful commanders to fight under, were the men who had served their time in coasters. And why? because they had to go through such a training, they had to encounter so many risks, endure so many perils, meet with circumstances making such demands upon their instant judgment, prompt skill, and ready courage, that when they quitted their trade and shipped elsewhere, they had nothing more to learn. They had seen the worst, and the sea had nothing fresh for them. Walk in their steps, young gentlemen, when you go to the sea, Master all you can, let nothing be too insignificant for you to ask about. Don't trouble yourselves about learning knots and how to make ornamental ends to ropes. View a ship as a big machine, and reason her out for yourself, as the builders and riggers did when they put her together. And above all things, never forget that the old red ensign is as noble a flag as the red cross. It's flown over hearts as manly, deeds as brave, Sufferings as great, heroism as beautiful as any you can read about in naval histories. It's the symbol of the wealth and commerce of this country. Its signal halyards come to your hands, young gentlemen, to the hands of you and to the like of you. Keep the old meter hoisted, let it be untarnished, and by your conduct as men and sailors let it blow as proudly upon the breeze as ever it has since it was first hoisted in the name of Britannia. And so God bless you, young gentlemen, and it is the hearty wish of Captain Weevil that you may all command fine ships and add fresh glory to the name of the British sailor by your skill when in danger and your decision when in difficulties and your humanity towards your fellow creatures and your integrity as men and by your reverence for the being whose majesty and power you will never better understand than when you are upon that old ocean whose heaving surface you have chosen for a calling and a home concluding his lecture in these words my old friend weevil seated himself amidst the loud applause of his audience and the most impressive memory I carried away with me from Captain Gale's little house was the self-complacency in Weevil's face as he sat listening to the plaudits of the boys with moist eyes fixed upon the chandelier and his hands clasped upon his waistcoat. End of section 14